Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Tips. Today I'm going to take you through an overview of Clearview, which is the setup software for ClearPath SC. If you're currently using a ClearPath MC or SD, those series require the MSP setup software, so this video isn't applicable. So to start, ClearPath's a servo system, and that means that you're able to optimize the motor's performance settings specifically for your set of mechanics and load. Clearview is used to tune ClearPath SC for optimal performance in your individual application. Clearview can also save and load these optimized settings, which we call a configuration file, or a config file for short. This allows OEMs to copy the motor settings and load them into motors for future machines. Clearview is also used to define the type of mode that ClearPath SC will be used in. In other words, you'll define if ClearPath SC will be controlled solely by your software code, or by a combination of your software and step and direction signals, or quad A and B signals. Before you have your code written, and your hardware fully ready to operate, you can use Clearview to generate moves and test your hardware. Clearview allows you to test homing, software limits, torque limits, sensors and switches, and other move-related parameters. Finally, Clearview has many built-in diagnostic tools that'll help you measure the operation and performance of the mechanics, motor, and control signals. For example, you can measure the actual torque being used in your application as a function of time. With these diagnostic tools, you can troubleshoot any mechanical, electrical, and software issues that you might run into. So let's get started. I'm going to go through a ClearPath SC demo to show how Clearview and the different diagnostic tools can be used in a real application. When you open Clearview, it might look like this. But if you press this plus button here, you'll open up an oscilloscope and a bunch of different variables that are associated with the scope. If we click this other plus button here, we can open up what's called the strip chart. The strip chart's useful for getting additional information on each move, on the drive status, and on the status of each input, all correlated in time. We'll go over how to use and read the scope and strip chart a bit later in this video. The next thing we need to do is cover the access menu. This is where you define which port you're accessing ClearPath SC through. A port is a connection point on the host PC, which allows for communication with external devices. But let's back up a minute so I can explain the differences between these options and what you'd use them for. There are a couple of different ports through which you can access information and control ClearPath SC. ClearPath SC is controlled through a device called the SC Communication Hub. This hub is what directs the communication signals from the host PC to all of the motors connected to the hub. You can run up to four SC motors per hub and four SC hubs per port. Three or even more ports can be in use at the same time, so you can control 48 or more motors in one SC system. The primary communication channel between the application code and the SC motors is called the application channel. There's also another channel called the diagnostic channel. The USB connection on the back of the SC motor is used as the diagnostic channel. The benefit of having a separate diagnostic channel is that it allows you to run your machine from your application code while simultaneously using Clearview for monitoring the performance of your machine on the diagnostic channel. So you can use this menu to switch from monitoring your machine's performance on the diagnostic channel to controlling the motors through Clearview's full access mode. Switching into full access mode automatically puts your application channel in monitor mode, which means that the application code is restricted from controlling the motors. When Clearview is set in monitor mode, the diagnostic channel has access to the scope, but most of the other settings and parameters in Clearview are read-only. In tuning mode, the diagnostic channel has access to the scope, tuning gains, and a few other settings. I'm going to leave this in full access mode so that we can cover all of the Clearview features. So when you first connect your motor to any type of mechanics, you'll want to tune or optimize the servo specifically for that setup. This setup menu bar is where you can access auto-tune. You'll want to tune the motor anytime you make changes to the mechanics so that you always get the best performance possible. This menu is also where you define what operational mode you're using. In my example application, I'm going to just use my software code alone to control the motor. If I wanted to, I could use step and direction signals to control the motor, along with my application code to read motor status and write motor parameters, and in that case, I would select step and direction. I could select quad A, B signals, if I wanted to control the motor with quadrature signals instead of step and direction. But I'm going to select software control and click OK so that we can continue with setting up the demo. Next, we'll run through the homing setup. Homing is the process that the motor runs through to define a repeatable zero or home position. Homing should occur upon every enable after power up or system reset, 
but in your application, you might do it more often. Homing is located in the Actions menu up at the top here. I'll select Homing Actions, and we can get to the setup. By setting up homing parameters in this dialog, there's almost no code to write to execute a homing procedure. So first, we have to define what direction we want to home in. We're going to home this stage to a physical hard stop, which is in the counterclockwise direction, so we'll select that here. Next, we can decide the velocity and acceleration for the homing process. I'll set the velocity at 100 RPM and the acceleration at 500 RPM per second. This section is where we decide if the motor is going to define home based on a hard stop or on a change in input status. An example of a change in input status would be like if we wired a sensor up to one of the inputs and the home position was defined based on when that input changed from high to low or from low to high. But for now, we'll just choose the hard stop. You can also choose a torque limit that's only in effect during homing. This allows you to use less than full torque when pressing up against the hard stop. I'll set this to 20%. We also need to set an offset move, which is the number of encoder counts that clear path moves away from the hard stop. And as this note says here, the encoder position will read zero after the offset move has completed. That's because the offset move is part of homing and zero is the home position. I'll set the offset as 1600 counts. When you have the change of input type of homing selected, you're allowed to choose the direction of the offset move. But since we're homing to a hard stop, it only makes sense to make the move in the direction opposite of the homing direction. Now I'll click OK. Typically, homing would occur when your application code commanded it to, but since I don't have any application code written yet, I'll simulate homing using Clearview. So we'll have to enable the motor first, which I can do right here. Then I can click Start Homing. Now you may have noticed that when the motor pressed against the hard stop and used torque up to the hard stop torque limit, there was a signal in this exception box here. This exception box will alert you if anything unusual has happened, so it'll give you warnings such as torque saturation or low voltage. It'll also let you know if the motor had to perform a safety shutdown. The warning or the shutdown is color-coded and there's a key located here if you click this question mark. During homing, we received a torque saturation signal. In this case, that's the system just telling you that homing used full allowable torque during the process, which is typical for hard stop homing, so there's no issue. Now the motor is homed and we can start the demo. So this section here is where you can generate test moves to control the motor without using your application code. You can see that there's a spot to define distance, velocity, acceleration, and dwell time between moves. You can also define what test moves you want to make. You could make a single move in one direction, or you could make a move back and forth. Those different moves exist in this drop-down menu. And over here is also a global torque limit that you can set if you determine that your mechanics can't take the full torque of the motor. Typically, the motor is sized for your mechanics, so you shouldn't have this issue, but the setting's here if you need it. I'm going to leave this at 100%. Right now, we're set up for a single move in one direction for 28,000 counts, a velocity of 1,000 RPM, and an acceleration of 2,000 RPM per second. This plus button and minus button will determine the direction of the moves, or the direction of the first move if we were to set up a, a back and forth move. You want to be careful with which direction you start, because if you command in the wrong direction, the motor could run into a hard stop. So one thing to do is to move the motor by hand to figure out which direction is which. Or if you remember, we homed in the counterclockwise direction, so we'll want to make our first move in the clockwise direction, which is negative. A better thing to do is to set up the software limits, which will prevent you from moving past home or your other end stop. Software limits are position limits that you can set in the Clearview software so that the motor cannot be commanded past these positions. I'll show you quickly how those work. The software limit setup is located under the setup menu at the top. We can define two software limits. I'll check this box here that says enable software limits, and then I'll set one limit as position zero. We'll make the other one negative 33,000 encoder counts. Now if I try to make a move that goes outside of these limits, the motor won't move. Let's try that. If I enter a move distance of 34,000 counts and try to make a negative move, I get a warning sign here that says move canceled soft limit. The system is telling us that the move we commanded is past the software limit that we set. If I make a shorter move inside of the limits like this, our move should be allowed.
Now let me explain a little bit more of the layout that we're looking at. This section here is what we call the dashboard. Right here is the indicator that tells you whether the motor is disabled or enabled. If the motor has shut down for safety or for self-protection, this signal will also let you know that the motor is in a shutdown state. This bar here indicates the current RMS torque level of the motor. Every motor has an RMS or essentially an average torque limit before it overheats. If it hits 100%, the motor will shut down to protect itself. When the motor's been sitting and resting for a while, the RMS level will be low, maybe even zero. What you can also see is the maximum RMS level that the motor has gotten to since you last cleared the value or powered off. You can clear the max level by double clicking on the indicator. Double clicking will set the RMS max to the current level on the meter. This window here shows the actual bus voltage that the motor is receiving. This is helpful for troubleshooting and monitoring to make sure that the motor is actually receiving the intended voltage from your power supply. Here's a position monitor and that just tells you what encoder count the motor is currently at. And this can be helpful to look at if you suspect any slipping in your mechanics or other troubleshooting situations. This is a velocity indicator and this gives you a short-term average readout of the motor velocity. These input A and input B software LEDs are status lights to tell you whether or not there is current running through the inputs. If you hover over this question mark, you can also find out if you set either input to control any action. In the setup menu, there's a feature called input actions. This feature allows you to base commands on the state of input A and input B. For example, I can command the motor to stop when one of the inputs turn off, or it can limit the torque based on the status of an input. So that's what these question marks represent. If I don't set the input actions as anything, the question marks will stay dim and tell me I haven't set anything up. Before we make the move, let's take a look at how we have our scope set up. The scope is similar to a hardware oscilloscope, except instead of measuring voltage versus time, you measure other variables such as torque or velocity versus time. Over here, you have the variable you're currently measuring. We're looking at actual torque right now. There are many other variables that you'll use located in this menu, but the three most common are probably tracking, commanded velocity, and actual torque. These variables, as well as the others listed here, are very helpful when it comes to measuring performance and troubleshooting. This dotted middle line here is the zero value of whatever you're measuring. In this case, it represents zero torque. And this top line here represents the max of your defined range. So in this case, the line represents 100% torque. The bottom line represents 100% torque in the opposite direction. And over here is where you'll define the range as well as your time base. The range setting is dependent on the variable. So the units and limits of your range change when your variable changes. The time base is what value each of these divisions represent horizontally in time. There are some cursors and also some ways to store traces. And there are different settings for when to trigger and different trigger modes. But all of that's beyond the scope of this video. So we'll measure the commanded velocity first. I'll set our time base to 100 milliseconds per division and the range to 2000 RPM since our move's running at 1000 RPM. We'll set the scope to trigger at the start of any command, and we'll set the trigger mode to normal. Make sure that when you're trying to use the scope that your trigger mode is not stop, because you won't be able to see anything if that's the case. If we command the move now, we can look at the scope and see what velocity we achieved, how long we were at constant velocity, what velocity we started at, how long the total move took, and other things. There are two cursors you can use to help you measure these parameters. We'll click this Show button in the Cursors area, which will bring out a pink and blue cursor. You can place these cursors on the beginning and end of the move. On the strip chart down here, you can see exactly when the move starts and when it ends if you look at the Move strip line. This gray area is where the move is in progress. It's interesting that the move looks a little bit shorter in time than it actually is. But when you look at the strip chart, you can see that the move ends here and not here where it might look like it does. That's because the RAS feature controls the jerk and jerk derivative of the move, which feathers it into a very soft stop at the end, which is hard to see without zooming in. There's also a G-stop feature that can be used to decrease machine vibration and resonances. The G-stop sculpts traditional motion profiles in such a way to remove energy from profiles where there are machine resonances and concentrate energy where there are none. There's more information about the RAS and G-stop available in other videos on Technic's website. Back to the scope. One nice thing that you can do is store up to two traces. So now if we wanted to take a look at how much torque this move is requiring, we can store this velocity trace and lay an actual torque trace over it. I'll click the store button here and switch my variable to actual torque. 
Now I'll move the motor back to where it started and command the move again, and we can see how much torque the motor requires. That doesn't require too much torque, about 5 to 10% of the motor's peak. So I'll increase the acceleration and I'll increase the velocity. And I'm going to go back to commanded velocity because our move is different now. Again, I'll move the motor back to where it started and command the move again. Now I'll store this velocity trace and look at the actual torque required for this move. You can see that the torque required is a bit higher for this move, about 15 to 20 percent. So it's nice to be able to look at a few different traces at a time. This can be especially helpful when troubleshooting. Now I'm going to command a move and use this E stop button to override the move. Watch the strip chart as I do this. So the E stop put the motor in a move lock, and we can see here that there's an exception called move lock. You can also see on the strip chart that the drive line has turned red, which means a warning or a shutdown state. This E stop can be used to stop the motor quickly. But keep in mind that it's software dependent and Windows dependent. It's not OSHA certified or anything, so you'll need to wire in a hardware safety stop for that. To clear this exception, or any exception, you can either disable and re-enable the motor, or you can just press this clear exceptions button, which will re-enable the motor and get rid of the warning. There's also another way to command motion from the motor. You can use this section here to manually jog the motor back and forth. Here you can select the speed, and the acceleration, but the distance is proportional to how long you hold the plus or minus buttons for. Now if I'm an OEM and I want to produce a lot of these machines, I'm going to want to save this config file. I can do this by going over to the file menu and clicking save configuration. This file menu is also where I would go to load the configuration file I just saved onto my other motors. Saving and loading config files allows you to store all of the move parameters like velocities and accelerations, and they also contain the motor gains and other settings. If you're making multiple copies of one machine, it's important to be able to save and load all this information efficiently. In the file menu, there's also this reset config file to factory defaults option. This returns all the settings and parameters to the original factory configuration that the motor arrived with. So if you ever mess up with some settings and you're not sure how to get back to where you started, just hit this button and you can start over. And if I want to name my motor, I can go to the edit menu and type in the motor ID. Preview will recognize the motor by what you've named it from there on after. There's a few things that I didn't get a chance to cover just because this is an overview, but they're pretty self-explanatory. And there's a lot of good information and more detail on these menu items in the user manual, so I highly suggest that you go through that. Conveniently enough, you can get to the manual through this About option. You can also access the S Foundation library documentation through this menu as well. The S Foundation documentation has example code and explains the ClearPath SC API. Hopefully this Tech Tips video has given you a nice overview of what the Clearview program provides in terms of different controls and diagnostic tools. If so, please give the video a thumbs up so that other ClearPath users check it out. If you'd like to be notified when we release new videos, click the Technic logo to subscribe. And here are some other videos that you might find useful as well. We'd also like to know what's helpful or what you'd like to see more of. We encourage you to give us your feedback and please feel free to ask any questions.